Fresh Sweater. <laughs> Hello, good morning. You're very welcome along to Ireland AM right here on Virgin Media One. You really are. Now from a tell-all biography to the latest cinema releases, we've got lots in store between now and 10. It's very diverse this morning. Very, isn't it? very busy show, yes. First up, the Witness Protection Programme. It is, of course, back in the news again. We're gonna be finding out I mean, what it is and how the, uh, the Witness Protection Programme works. That's coming up at quarter past seven. It's Dyslexia Awareness Day. Throughout the morning, we'll be learning about the condition and highlighting some of the barriers that still exist for people with dyslexia. Now, this is a collaboration I didn't see coming. You, or was it a collaboration? You and Be Perfect Cosmetics. You and Charlotte Tilbury. What is it? No, it's not the collab. I've been waiting for that collab. Were you looking for that? Can't wait until oh, you do the highlight You're going to be really excited with this one. Uh, former TD Shane Ross has written a biography all about the Sinn Féin president, Mary Lou MacDonald. He is going to be joining us in studio a little bit later on to discuss. I wonder, is Mary Lou happy with that? I wonder, is Katie Taylor not in that picture somewhere? No? <laughs> he does like Katie. He does like Katie Taylor. Uh, Alan, what else have we got coming up this morning? Well, Mirren, later this morning, we're going to be talking to a trans activist who's raising awareness about the National Gender Service that urgently needs more staff and resources. And our Derek is in Grace Downs County Wicklow this morning. Good morning to Derek. What's the weather looking like? I am indeed, Alan. A very good morning to you back at base. Well, a bit of a breather out there this morning, but once again, plenty more showers, plenty of wind out there today, especially across the northern half of the country. But as you mentioned there, right, we'll come down here to Greystones in County Wicklow, and we're going to be complimenting your studio interview on dyslexia a little bit later on. We're off to visit a primary school, and we're going to be investigating the early indicators, the early signs of uh, dyslexia, and we're going to be finding out what the teachers on the ground are using in terms of their resources to help make life that little bit easier for the kids in the classroom. Yeah, fair play and it looks like uh, yeah, starting to brighten up a little bit. That okay. cycle path is mad yeah, busy this morning. Chat. He's standing in it because <laughs> there's no one there. Okay, time to get the news over to Anne O'Donnell. Thanks, Tommy. Good morning. Well, Ireland's electricity supply system will face shortages over the coming years. That's according to a report published today by Airgrid. Well, this year's statement forecasts significant electricity supply and demand issues, and it warns that the number of system alerts will increase as our economy grows. A post-mortem is due to be carried out on the body of a man who died following assault in Tralee yesterday. The man's wife was also injured in the incident. Our Western reporter Eric Clark reports. Gardaí are continuing to investigate the violent incident here at Nurat Cemetery in Tralee. Shortly before midday yesterday, a man aged in his mid-40s was fatally stabbed. His wife was also stabbed and taken to University Hospital Kerry. Her injuries described as non-life-threatening. They had been attending a burial in the cemetery. An altercation erupted shortly before midday involving a group of people. A Gardaí and emergency services attended. Gardaí say the man was pronounced dead at the scene. His body was then removed to University Hospital Kerry for post-mortem examination. A large area of the cemetery was sealed off for technical examination last night. Gardaí also conducting searches on the grounds here and a number of follow-up searches were also uh, taking place in parts of Kerry and Cork. Gardaí have established an incident room at Tralee Garda Station and a senior investigating officer has been appointed. They spoke to a number of mourners attending the funeral uh, with the purpose of getting witness statements and they've also appealed for any other witnesses or anyone with uh, camera footage that would be useful to their investigation to contact them at Tralee Garda Station or at any Garda Station. The chief medical officer has expressed concern over the number of patients who have been hospitalised with COVID-19 in recent days. Professor Breda Smith is also encouraging those eligible for a COVID-19 booster jab to avail of it as we head into the winter. Our news correspondent Sarah King has the details. 
Well, the new Chief Medical Officer is Professor Breda Smith, who was announced yesterday by the Health Minister Stephen Donnelly. Professor Smith has been the interim CMO for the last three months, but was formally uh, appointed yesterday. Now, in her first uh, interviews since being appointed as CMO, Professor Smith has outlined uh, her plans for the winter in terms of protecting the public against uh, COVID-19. She's also expressed some concern about the number of COVID-19 patients uh, now presenting in hospital, saying that the seven-day uh, average is around 60% patients a day being admitted to hospital in relation to COVID. Uh, she also says that 70% of those patients are 65 years and over and says that 40% of those haven't had their COVID booster. Well, I think it is um, less likely to, to, you know, when the weather is fine, we've had a very mild September and um, there was less illness circulating, less respiratory viruses, that it will be kind of a human reaction um, not to be as worried. Um, and I'm not saying that people need to go back to the levels of worry that we had. Well, we do have the vaccine now and we might as well use it and use it to protect ourselves. Well, the new chief medical officer says that COVID-19 booster vaccines are available uh, alongside flu vaccines and that people can go and get both uh, on the one appointment. She also says that uh, healthy adults now do not need to necessarily take antigen tests on a regular basis, but she does warn that those with symptoms should self-isolate until those symptoms clear for 48 hours. The European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen has laid out the EU's winter energy plan as the war in Ukraine puts energy supplies across the continent in jeopardy. In response, she's set out an energy plan for resilience, including gas storage and reducing reliance on Russian fossil fuels, investing in sustainable energy supplies and redistributing windfall profits from energy companies. We will have key instruments in place to make it through the winter, that's storage and saving, to jointly purchase gas, this is our platform, to get rid of the grip the Russians have on us through their fossil fuels, these are our agreements with other friends, to redistribute the windfall profits to support those in need and to invest in the future of a sustainable energy supply, and that is Repower EU. For car insurance, van insurance, or home insurance. Call the quote devil. Unless, of course, you've got money to burn. Thank you, Anne Marie. A very good morning to you at home, or if you're indeed watching us online on the player. We're coming to you live here from beautiful Grace Jones down in County Wicklow this morning. And over the next wee while, we're off to visit a local primary school to tie in with their Dyslexia Awareness Day. So that's all to come into the 8 o'clock hour. Anyway, let's take an opening look at weather together now with Mark Rigney on cameras. And I have to say, a bit of a breather of a start from all that wind, all that rain we've been having over the last few days. Now, we are still seeing showers through parts of Donegal into North Monaghan into Offaly and parts of Dublin but elsewhere we are seeing a little bit of morning drizzle but it is a much improved one as I mentioned but still quite windy through the southwest strong and blustery at times now right across today in fact we're going to see more rain on the way this time affecting mainly across the northern half of the islands that rain leaning again on the heavy and persistent side a good squeeze on those isobars too so it will be quite a windy day in store with the best of brightness down south and a little lift you'll be glad to hear in terms of temperatures top values of 13 to 17 degrees. So as that rain clears out then into tonight, guess what? More rain pulling in from the northwest as another system tracks in across the country. That'll sink in a southeasterly direction. So another wet, another windy night in stores. We work away into tomorrow morning with overnight lows back to 7 to 13 degrees. So a little bit up once again on last night. So that's how we're shaping up here in Greystones and County Wicklow at the moment. We'll catch you back live at 7.35. For first-time drivers, young drivers, returning drivers, if you've had an open claim or have had too many penalty points. The quote devil's always got one hell of a quote. Now coming up on Ireland AM, a life of exile and looking over your shoulder. We'll be finding out how the Witness Security Programme works. Yeah, Ireland AM is back after this short break.
Now, former Sinn Féin councillor Jonathan Dowdell is being assessed for witness security programme. Now, to give us an insight into how it actually works is criminologist John Dean O'Keefe. Good morning, John. Good it's morning, lovely to John. have you here. Thank you very much. So this is, you know, we see WITSEC, witness, <clears throat> you know, as an American thing, mm. but it was brought into Ireland in the in the wake of, of Veronica Guerin's murder. That's right. And when you hear WITSEC, of course, the first thing you think about is it's a witness protection programme, and it is, but the reality is 95% of people who are on these witness protection programmes are a offenders themselves. So it's only the 5% of people who just happen to be passing and something happened, you know, mm. so they don't really count for very many. But that many. would be like, we'll say, the Collins family, Roy Collins, who was murdered in yeah. Limerick and his family Oh, had of to course, go they'd into... absolutely be part of that, of that 5%. Yeah. But most, most people who are going into it obviously know stuff. And to know stuff, you need to be in the organisation. So, so people, the public has an interesting attitude to this. You know, half of us think, isn't it a great idea because justice is being served? But the other half's a bit unpal unpalatable as well because you're thinking, well, these people are getting away with it to an extent. At least that's what people think. Well, because of this case with John Dowdell, of course, it's around the Jerry the Monk Hutch trial, which mm -hmm. was all set to get started last week. It turns <clears> out now Jonathan is going to turn state witness and will be put into this witness protection programme. But I was reading there, so it, this will probably cost the taxpayers €100,000 Mm. I think that's per year, pretty much, to try and re relocate him. Yeah. He's going to be sent to an English-speaking country. Mm. How does it work? Well, the, the funny thing about it is we don't know how it works, and that's almost intentional because it's quite a secretive small group of people who work within Angar the Shia who look after witness protection. There aren't a lot of people under the level of protection that you're talking about, in other words, who go to another country. But the important thing to remember is there's an equivalence. So you're not going to be, I don't know, on the dole here and then have a massive man for yourself in Scotland or in Australia. Mm. That's not the way it works. I think that's the popular myth about it. So people will get an equivalence and you will be forced, if you like, to get work and live a normal life insofar as you can. Uh, but yes, there is a huge relocation cost which can be borne by both the state sending the person and indeed by the host state. We in Ireland, of course, have some people here at the moment who will have come from another jurisdiction to us. That's what I'm saying. So it mm. does, like, we send people to other places Absolutely. and we get people sent here. Uh, yeah, and as Tommy says, Anglo phone countries, in other words, English-speaking countries, and where's the obvious one they're going to go? Well, we're not, probably not going to send them to Australia or Canada. We're probably, they're probably going to go to Britain in all likelihood. Really? Probably. So I'll because... give you an example. I mean, uh, some people from the north uh, during the Troubles were sent to, there seems to be some fascination with cities in the north of England for some reason, and a couple of them were up in Preston, and, 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 and they were spotted, of course, by people and pictures taken and yeah. so on. So, I, I mean, the, I don't, the, the logic to it I'm unsure of. I would think that you'd want to be sent as far away as possible <clears throat> because if you think just over the channel and, and with social media, the world getting so much slower and nowadays. Get yourself a bit of Duolingo. Yeah, but, but Learn hang... a different language. So yeah, that well, there really is that as you. well. But you're, I mean... Uh, yeah. Social media, yes, can be responsible for exposing people who are on witness protection. But the people, the reason it really happens is because of the witnesses themselves. Remember, if you're looking at 95% of these people who are offenders, leave it aside the 5%, but the 95% who might be offenders, they've got a different psychological template. A lot of them can be impulsive. A lot of them can have personality disorders anyway. We know, for example, in prison, 60, 70% of prisoners may have undiagnosed personality mm. disorders. And now you're going to send these people off and say, there's a new life for you over there. They couldn't carve out a life for themselves here and now they're expected to go somewhere else and carve out one. They unfortunately, because of their impulsivity a lot of the time, will let people know who they are. Are we then, are countries then just exporting problems? You know when you're younger and you're in a classroom and a teacher's like, I can't deal with you anymore, go across the hall yeah. to Miss O'Shea's class. Like, do we, I suppose it's so secretive, like, do we know that they're, that someone is transferred to another jurisdiction and they just get into criminology there? Well, that is possible. The only thing to be said about that is if they're in the really high-level programmes, they're likely to be watched by the domestic police forces. Yeah. So the likelihood of them getting involved is probably small. However, there have been examples, and fairly public examples, of people who are on essentially witness protection programmes, such as the, uh, the Jamie Bulger murder, Robert Thompson and John Venables. And, of course, they have, uh, one of them particularly, John Venables, yeah. has been a recidivist criminal for very serious sexual offences over in Britain and he has been uh, under the uh, eye of the police and he's been in and out of prison for the last 10 years for incredibly serious offences. Yeah. So, but, uh, you know, you might say there would have been worse but for the fact that police were, you know, at least keeping an eye on him. There's an argument to how, how good an eye they were keeping him. Mm. But uh, this is something that you see in 
true crime and crime dramas. You see the somebody going into the the witness uh, to, mm. to get interviewed by the the police or whatever, and they go and they turn their story and they get you know they want immunity. Yeah. So in Ireland, have we got this set up? I gather we don't have formal legislation for no, this. No, we don't. But the guards can still offer it. Yeah, they can still offer it. Now, to be offered it, you're going to, it's going to have to be a significant case. Like, nobody's going to be getting witness protection for robbing a, a can of beans in Tesco. Mm. You know, it's a very significant case where there's an awful lot at stake. So, for example, uh, organised crime gangs f w will, be, w will be an example. But you need to be the right person. You know, mm. not every person is going to be suitable for witness protection. And that discussion will have to be had and the guards and others and psychologists will need to make that but decision. This, this could be hugely beneficial for the guards in yes. putting together this case for against, this say, uh, for anyone. Jerry the Moncomps for or anyone. anything. But in particular, this case, this could be a huge moment for the guards to try and turn around. Turn yeah, and around. these are big moments. Remember where all this started, back with the Mafia and Omerta. They couldn't get through to these organisations, so what did they do? They get somebody to snitch. Now, inside, of course, there's yeah. a phrase in the States called snitches get stitches, and that's one of the problems because it's, it's, it's a very dangerous thing to do, and that's why these programmes are, are so tight, not just for those people, mm. but for their families. Yeah. What do you do about their families and their friends, which, which can extend up to 100 people, for example? Because, of course, they're not all going to be going wherever this person is going. Yeah. Yes, and there, there is, you know, as you said, there's an equivalence, but also the greater good. You know, someone oh, yeah. who has done bad stuff mm. getting off, essentially, in order to get a person who has done worse stuff. And I'm sure for some victims, that's very hard to get your head around. Oh, yeah. As you said, it was based on uh, 1950s emerged in America, mm -hmm. trying to turn mafia, uh, mafia people over. In Ireland, is yeah. our programme... You know, you don't hear, it comes up every once in a while, you yeah. know, Veronica Guerin, I think Roy Collins probably, and now again. Um, is it incredibly secretive? Yes. Do we know what goes on? Because we keep on going, well, he's definitely going to an English-speaking country. Yeah, well, I mean, I don't know that for sure. But, I mean, of course, the likelihood is he is. It's very secretive. Now, there's advantages and disadvantages to that. By definition, you'd want it to be secretive. You wouldn't really want to know how it operates, where people typically go and yeah. so on. On the other hand, you do want transparency. Now, we do have legislation. You can't intimidate a witness. You could end a maximum sentence of 15 years in prison. You can't identify a witness, maximum sentence, five years in prison. But they're piecemeal bits of legislation. We don't have anything that surrounds the whole area of witness protection. Well, it's, it's, a, it's a guard, a cir it's circular. It's the protection unit within Angarda Shiakona, which is under the special detective unit, which itself is under a broader unit. And there's only a few people on it and well, who, who work it. Uh, and well, that's also because it doesn't happen very often. Yeah. There is low-level witness protection, by the way, the less glamorous stuff, okay. where guards are maybe parked outside somebody's house yeah. for 24 hours a day or going past during the day or whatever. So once you get your new passport, you get your new house, you get all set up, do you, do you keep getting payments for the rest of your life? I will, you know, I think the payments thing is a little bit exaggerated okay. because you are expected to work in the jurisdiction you're in. But then again, these people have been in criminality, a lot of them, yeah. all their lives. So what are they going to do? Just work in their local bank? So it is quite difficult. But then they'll go on uh, social protection, which will need to be uh, uh, paid back by the state who's sending them over there in the first place. So, you know, there, there's still an obligation, a financial obligation. It doesn't continue ad infinitum. But it might. I mean, you could see how it could go on for a long time. And if the greater good, as you say, is being served, the state will say it's worth it. And I know we've gone over time, but can people opt out of it? Say you're, you've been away for five years and like, I hate this, I want to go home. Well, I mean, there will be negotiations beforehand to, uh, so that you can't do that. But it's like any contract, you can always get out of it by simply not doing it. But no, the, the, you will be persuaded to stay in for your own sake and indeed the sake of your family and friends. Very okay. interesting. Criminologist uh, John O'Keefe, thank you so much for joining us this morning. Very interesting, yes, indeed. Um, we'll have more coming up. We're going to be talking about World Dyslexia Awareness Day very shortly. First, we're going to take a look through the stories making the front of the newspaper. See you back here in a few minutes. It's time now to take a look at this morning's papers. We'll start with the Irish Times. Its headline, House Prices Overvalued by at Least 7% says the ERSI. Irish house prices are overvalued by at least 7%, the Economic and Social Research Institute has said. 
how cheating claims are rocking the world of Irish dancing. That's the front page of the Irish Independent. Irish dancing judges accused of fixing competitions have been allowed to continue overseeing major competitions the paper can reveal. Exclusives this morning. It's a big one, though. The examiner leads with reprisals, fears after funeral stabbing. A feud over an arranged marriage may have been behind a man being stabbed to death and his wife injured as they attended a funeral in Kerry yesterday. The mirror goes with that same story. Story, their headline, Stabbed to Death at Funeral. The Sun leads with Stabbed to Death at Funeral also. The Star leads with the same story, their headline, Bloodbath at the Graveyard. Irish dancing hit by results fixing claims is the top story on the Daily Mail. The world of Irish dancing has been rocked by an official investigation into alleged results fixing. The Kerry Cemetery killing may have been linked to a feud over an arranged marriage, which you and, just saw in the headlines. Yeah, and joining us now with that story and everything else is News Talk, Andrea Gilligan. Good morning, morning. Andrea. And I mean, obviously, um, very, very sad situation yesterday, but there are fears now of reprisals yeah, because this is an ongoing feud. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, just I suppose by way of context, this happened um, at, a, at a funeral burial in a cemetery, mm -hmm. um, the New Rat Cemetery in, in Rathas and Tralee. Yesterday morning, um, mourners had gathered for the burial of a, a young woman, a mother of five, who'd passed away quite suddenly, actually, on, sun on Sunday. And um, there was obviously a large crowd there in the congregation, and it's understood that a group of people arrived, according to reports uh, across various different papers today, um, armed with what are believed to have been um, weapons with yeah, them. slash hooks and yeah. machetes. And that they arrived at the ceremony. Um, two people were injured, one of them fatally, who's now been named locally as uh, Thomas Dooley, a man in his 40s, a, a father. And his wife as well, also named locally as Siobhan, was, was injured. Mm. Um, the Gardaí, the emergency services, they were all called to the scene and uh, Mr Dooley was pronounced dead at the scene by, by paramedics. His wife was taken uh, to hospital literally just across the road where she remains this morning and is being treated mm. for what's been believed actually to be non-life-threatening non um, injuries. But I think just the, the scale of what happened, you know, like aside from the fact that it happened at a funeral yes. burial... In the middle um, of the day. In the middle, in the, the early morning, in front of a large crowd of people, has it's just sent shockwaves right across the country. Now, there's a number of... Obviously, there's a guard investigation underway into this. The guards have appealed for information. They've appealed for people who are at, in the ceremony, you know, at the funeral burial to come forward. They've appealed for anyone with um, camera or CCTV footage to also please make that available to them. But they are investigating a number of lines um, of inquiry. Yeah. Uh, we've learned from, from the papers this morning, one of which is that it was understood that um, the attack was motivated by a personal grievance, believed to be a sort of a, a snub or a sign of disrespect. It was also reported, as you mentioned in the headlines today as well, that um, it may have been over an alleged arranged marriage. Yeah. yeah. There's and, uh, fire bombings of houses and there's all different things, all it's different stories going part, around Part of an ongoing yeah. feud that's, yeah. that's, uh, that appears to be underway at the moment. The guards seem to be aware of, uh, of who's involved in that. And now there are concerns, as you mentioned, <clears throat> Alan, that there, there may be, you know, a yeah. fear of reprisal yeah. following on from that. And, and I see that... Um, uh, we've also learned as well from the papers today that Thomas Dooley was a member of the travelling community and I see in the Irish Examiner that uh, Pave Point, um, the group representing travellers, mm. have actually come out this morning and appealed uh, for CAM. They've appealed for, you know, uh, people, uh, anybody yeah. who's yes. in, a, I suppose, a position of leadership to... Um, just to, to ensure that there really is no yeah. Yeah. reprisal following this incident. But look, it's a terrible, terrible tragedy and, and a, just an awful shock Absolutely. for anybody that was there or, or at this funeral yesterday. Um, and as I said, there is an, an incident room too open and this investigation, yeah. guard investigation, is, is underway. But we, We'll be hearing more about yeah. that. Um, the story that caught all our eyes this morning and we just were like, what? Irish dancing cheating scandal. Yeah. Scandal. It's all like front pages. I know. Where did we ever think that but the front pages of Irish newspapers would be going an I'm Irish not, dancing cheating scandal? I'm not surprised at all. This was Ellen Coyne was here with us yesterday, sitting where you are, and this is her exclusive story on what's going on within the world of Irish dancing, which is fiercely competitive. I was an Irish dancer for years myself and danced with um, under the, the CLRG um, on Commission Lorinka Gaelica, which is the, the sort of the guardian of Irish dancing, the, the oldest or the largest, you know, Irish dancing governing body in the country. And, like, I was just stunned when I saw this last night. I was heartbroken, if I'm honest. You Were know, you? I, yeah, I really so was. What, what, because what, what's happened? So what what's the, the story is that... Um, so, on Commission Lorinka Gaelica had been made aware of screenshots that had been sent to them 
um, purporting to be of, of alleged text messages from 12 different Irish dancing teachers yes. either asking for or offering to uh, fix results yeah. around competitions. Now, what happens, I suppose, by way of context for people is that, you know, you're, um, a lot of Irish dancing teachers, of which it is quite an arduous process to become a dance teacher, there's an awful lot of, you know, examination, yeah. um, study that, that, that's involved with it, and that leads on to becoming then a judge at what are often national, world and international American mm -hmm. dance competitions. These are, you know, you'd have a lot of the qualifying criteria, you'd go to different fetches around the country yeah, to yeah. try and, you know, get through to the nationals, the worlds, the Europeans. And the allegation is that judges um, or the dance teachers who were judges had had offered to or asked for results for their competitors to be, to be fixed. fixed. It's, it's also alleged as well from the screenshots, some of, some of the dance teachers, we understand, um, are thought to be Irish. Not all, though, from... Yeah, yeah from some of them that, are, are, are not, yeah, not, should, not... But, like, not some Irish of them were exchanging said. sexual favours for higher scores. That is the, the is allegation. This, can I just ask you, is yeah. this where you just win a trophy? What you, sorry, is it like you win? You get the higher score to win a trophy. Oh yeah, and, yeah. To, and to qualify, to qualify though for which we'll national world championships. But if you championships. get to the world, you still win a trophy. Yeah. yeah. So people are exchanging sexual favours to win a trophy. Yeah. Well, that's the allegation, certainly. I don't think of... you get how how big this. Like, do you know? How I, big obviously this world is? I, like, this is no, I obviously don't. I no. I obviously get China how to big. America. I know, but it's at the end of the day, you win a trophy. But there's huge business in this. Yeah. You could there's say that about any sport, though. In you know, Irish it's, dancing. Like, it's it's a massive, massive industry. It's actually a very expensive industry to to be a part of as well, in terms of being able to you know to, to be a, a, a heavyweight competitor at a world championship level is it's an ex, you know it is an expensive hobby. There's a huge level. Oh, I understand of, that, of and I know and lots, lots of people in the and like in Irish in dancing. World, and yeah. how serious they yeah, take yeah, it. Yeah, 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 it's huge. But to exchange sexual favours to get well, that, higher to be, marks. That is the allegation. Allegations yeah, that of some one of the texts from Yeah, one from of the texts from it. But the CLRG are aware of this. This was actually brought to their attention, we've learned, back in July. Um, this was given the, the, the really serious nature of this. Um, they've actually gone on to appoint a former Court of Appeal judge to investigate it. Yeah. Because uh, obviously it goes against well, naturally their, their code of conduct. For anyone, yeah, completely. Have you offered to exchange? I'm joking, I'm joking, I'm joking. <laughs> uh, you can get in contact on 0896 111 uh, to get in contact on any of our stories today because I think this dancing story... Ah, look, is it is. And I, I, I understand that, yeah, to, like, totally people will, will read this this morning and go, what, the Irish dancing no, world? It's... But, it, like, when you're a part of it, I can just imagine the competitors out there listening to this today and their parents who get up every Saturday and yeah. Sunday morning and travel the country. I'd say there a lot of people would be heartbroken. I know. It's to this. unbelievable. Andrew Gilligan, Gilligan from News Talk, thank you so much for joining thank us you. this morning. Coming up uh, on Ireland AM, we'll be talking about World uh, Dyslexia Day. Ireland AM is back in a few minutes. Very welcome back. Now, all morning we are going to be celebrating Dyslexic Awareness Day. Joining us now is Rosie Bissett, the CEO of Dyslexia Association of Ireland, and actress Jane McGrath to chat about living with dyslexia. It's lovely to have you both here. Thank you so much. And I think, Rosie, first of all, it's it's something that was very much not understood at all. We got diagnosis. People are understanding it more, but what exactly is it for people? Okay, um, at its simplest level, I suppose, dyslexia is a learning difference, which uh, primarily affects learning to read, write and spell accurately and fluently. And I suppose the challenge mostly comes from being able to match the sounds and process the sounds of language and map them against the visual symbols. Um, but it's very varied. It goes on a spectrum and it affects a lot of people differently too. Yeah. So what sort of signs should parents, for instance, or teachers be looking out for? Um, well, certainly a ch the most obvious thing is a child who's not picking up literacy. They're not retaining it. They're struggling to sound out. They're struggling to remember uh, what they've learnt. Um, the phonics, um, uh, you know, can be trickier for them, but yet it's really important that they get really good teaching in that. And I suppose the classic thing that most dyslexics will talk about is, you know, the challenges of reading out loud in class, maybe stumbling over words, mixing up words that look similar, so mixing up was and saw, um, the spelling test, you know, parents spending hours working with them on a Thursday evening but come Friday morning it's like they just fell out yeah. you know um, and that's really frustrating for everyone you know and Jane I can see you nodding your yeah. head there you're <laughs> like you can really yes. trauma. sorry Jane <laughs> yeah. but what what was it like for you was it caught early or was it later 
Well, for me, like this is, I have to tell you my age now. So back in the 90s, when I was in primary school, um, people didn't really know what dyslexia was. Yeah. And um, it's, it's not something that can be cured. It's something you kind of live with. And one thing Rosie said was, it's a learning difference, which is the first time I ever heard that. <laughs> and I think that's kind of good because you do have to be aware about the language you use around it. So rather than saying, you know, strengths and weaknesses, talk about strengths and challenges with your dyslexia. So I was actually only diagnosed when I was 14 years old. Oh, that's and very... That's when I was in secondary school, yeah. And yeah. at that stage, because I'm just wondering, being so young and not having a name for something, but there's challenges. Yeah. That must have led to problems in the yes. classroom. Um, I really thought there was something wrong with me. Mm -hmm. And you do stay very quiet. And there was a time in, in primary school, especially, where I'd make a lot of jokes in class because that was the way I felt accepted in, you know, the education world. Yeah. And by making people laugh, I had that kind of control. And I think that's one of the main reasons I kind of went down the acting route, because that was kind of my, my wheelhouse. But, um, yeah, no, then coming into secondary school, um, my principal actually got in touch with my mother and said, do you ever think that Jane might have dyslexia? And of course, my mum was like, what's dyslexia? You know, and um, so we got on to the DAI and I got assessed and um, I got to miss a few exams, which was great. Um, but the, the sense of relief when I got yeah. diagnosed was great. Uh, when I look at some of the, pe the people who've come out and said that they've been diagnosed with dyslexia. I mean, Jamie Oliver, the, the chef, you have Steven Spielberg, Richard Branson, of course, the founder of Virgin, even Albert Einstein. Is there, is there a creative side to people who are diagnosed with dyslexia? And is this almost like a superpower? I know Richard Branson talks about to encourage dyslexic thinking. So some, some people certainly would describe dyslexia as their superpower. Not everyone would though, so okay. I suppose. Um, I think certainly we would see that Dyslexia can really force someone to play on their strengths and focus on their strengths. Mm. So if you look at, let's say, Jamie Oliver, mm. he went down a route where he focused on his creativity, his um, obviously his cooking skills, communication skills. So I think people with dyslexia often um, are great at building those other side of their skill sets, you know, so they'll be great at coming up with creative solutions. They'll be innovators. They'll be um, good at working with people because obviously if you struggle dealing with reading, you know, you're not going to be the person who, when you get the kit home from Ikea, reads all the instructions, etc. You're going to be the person who looks at it and says, <laughs> I can oh, do that. I can do that. I can work that out. You visualize it. You become, you. so you almost, you. it forces you to build those other skills and sides and of yourself. Is that something, because that sounds to me fantastic, that there are other sides to you that you can really excel at. So does the education system help that? because it I wouldn't seem to me. Yeah, mm. no, that is that is the challenge. And while, in, look, our education system is evolving, but it evolves at a slow rate, yeah. you know? Um, obviously, we've made submissions around leaving search reform and things like that, cause, calling for a lot more innovation in terms of the, how the curriculum is d delivered, looking for more variety in how we assess. We still have the vast majority of kids sitting in exam halls in June yeah. at the end of their, you know, junior cycle, senior cycle. Um, and that's not the way that you can best capture yeah. anyone's skills. I mean, we all know from our working lives, you know, we don't sit down anywhere and write for three hours. You know, we'd pass away if we did, you know. Yeah. We work in groups, we collaborate, we use technology, we talk to people, we have meetings, yeah. you know. Yeah. So it's trying to bring that into the education And system. certainly an awful lot has to be done because it's so linear and there's so yeah. many sides to people's brains. But for Jane, for, for you, like you went into acting, which yeah. means a lot of reading of scripts, a lot yes. of, yeah. here, get this done. Because what was like, I thinking? But like you were in Red Rock, you know, an hour long where you're going, yeah. oh my God. Yeah, I actually found all my old Red Rock stuff there recently. And I was going through, you know, favourite episodes that I kept. And I think we did about 180 episodes. So, like. yeah, if you think about it, like we're, the turnaround was so fast and, you know, we'd get scripts on a Friday. And then by the time Monday comes, you need to have read the scripts, know what's going on, where you, the energy you're bringing into the scene is and everything like that. You're working with maybe three directors in, in one go. So you'd be working off 
maybe nine scripts in, in one week, you know, so you'd be rehearsing this one. Like you didn't pick the easiest one. job for yourself. I guess not. I suppose, yeah, no, Red Rock, yeah, there's a lot of uh, challenges. <laughs> yeah, but uh, I suppose um, just with, with my dyslexia, I think the most important thing is to be kind of accepting of it and also people want to help you as well yeah. like there there was a time when when you stayed very quiet that's where the torture comes in and then you've got the imposing thoughts but um like for example reading doing our first table read and you've got like loads of producers in the room directors you've got all the actors and then you've got guests coming in and then if we're kind of in a flow in a scene and you're you're reading it i i know i will always stumble okay. everything just starts dancing so at home i would have my colored pens my markers and even then if there's a word that i know that i will just not be able to get out of my mouth and the the stakes are very high in the scene i'd be like blah, 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 blah. what's that word somebody would just say it at me blah, 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 and we just keep going you know okay. people understand word, yeah the words yeah, start dancing good. i think that's one yeah. of the best ways i've ever heard it described actually that's yeah. that's really amazing <laughs> and i know it is you know you got in in touch with the Dyslexic Association of Ireland when this happens to you and it is there to help. So Rosie yeah. Bissett, uh, CEO, thank you so much. And Jane McGrath, it's a pleasure to thank have you today. Thank us. you so much for having thank us. You. Cheers. Um, you can get in contact with us 0896 111 and we're staying with Dyslexia Awareness Day. Derek is at a school in Greystones County Wicklow. Morning, Derek. Yes, Myrna, we've been listening quite intently there to that interesting interview back at base. And to tie in with uh, Dyslexia Awareness Day, we've landed down here at Greystones Community National School here in the Garden County. We're going to be catching up with the Vice Principal, also a Special Needs Assistant, as well as some of the students here in the school to find out how they deal with dyslexia and the resources that they use to help kids cope in the classroom. Thank you very much, Derek. Now, still to come this morning, Shane Ross is going to be telling us why he's written a biography about Sinn Féin President Mary Lou MacDonald. Plus, Alberto Rossi is in the kitchen serving up homemade tortellini. We'll see in a few minutes. Welcome back to the second hour of Ireland AM. Uh, former government minister Shane Ross is going to be here to discuss his revealing biography about the Sinn Féin leader, Mary Lou Macdonald. That's coming up quarter past eight. We'll also be meeting trans activist Noah Halpin, who is raising awareness around the model of care for transgender people in Ireland and why it needs to change. That's coming up later on. Plus, he's a triple threat. He acts, he dances, and now he's making his direct Tutorial debut. Ooh. There you go. Fair City's Ryan Andrews is going to be here to chat about his Marilyn Monroe stage production. Love oh, Ryan. He's just like a ray of nice. sunshine. Love Brighten up the morning, Eva. Uh, now, Alan is in the kitchen. Is he going to give us his Italian accent? Are you going to do it again for well, us? Well, good morning to you. <laughs> <laughs> we have an Italian dish in the kitchen and it's not just Alberto. Yes, Alberto, what's on the menu uh, this morning? Buongiorno, Anna. It's all good. We, we, we're doing tortellini uh, with spinach and ricotta. So it's like we so call... What's a tortellini? Tortellini. tortellini is like a shaped pasta and you feel it. So it's a filled pasta you can buy also in the shop or you don't, but why would oh, you? Yeah. You know, and then it's served with uh, chicken stock, so it's very wintry, very from the north of Italy, where I come from, very classic. And very tasty. Very tasty, absolutely. Looking forward to that. So, tortellini coming up. Now, Derek is in Greystones all morning uh, as we're celebrating World Dyslexia Awareness Day. Derek, what have you got in the next hour? Yes, uh, live here down at Greystones Community National School right across the morning. Uh, we're talking all things dyslexia at 8.35. We're going to be catching up with the vice principal, some of the kids as well as a special needs assistant. Check out the board here behind me. Uh, they're focusing in on dyslexic strengths, dyslexia challenges, and even hear a quote from uh, the famous Steven Spielberg. He said, dyslexia is more common than you can imagine. You are not alone. So that's all to come here from Greystones County Wicklow in the next few while. It's time now to take a look at this morning's papers. We'll start with the Irish Times. It's headline, house prices overvalued by at least 7%. House prices are overvalued by at least 7%. The Economic and Social Research Institute has said. 
How cheating claims are rocking the world of Irish dancing. That's the front page of the Irish Independent. Irish dancing judges accused of fixing competitions have been allowed to continue overseeing major competitions. This paper can reveal. The examiner leads with reprisal fears after funeral stabbing. A feud over an arranged marriage may have been behind a man being stabbed to death and his wife injured as they attended a funeral in Kerry yesterday. The mayor goes with the same story. Their headline, stabbed to death at funeral. And the son has that exact same headline, stabbed to death at a funeral. The star leads with the same story. Their headline, bloodbath at the graveyard. Irish dancing hit by results fixing claims is the top story on the Daily Mail. The world of Irish dancing has been rocked by an official investigation into alleged results fixing. And we have received some messages on that, Alan. We certainly have. I mean, the... I know I was, you, you sort of, I, you thought maybe I was a bit going a bit sort of not taking it seriously earlier on. And to be fair, and because no. Andrea, Gill Andrea Gilligan, who was discussing the news with you, yeah. like, you could see she was really upset, she was upset about she it. Like, and I went, at the end of the day, you win a trophy. But for like, these people who put That's so more much... more than that. No, for God's sake. At the end of the day, it still is a trophy. That's what I was saying. Like but I do understand it. the amount of effort and time and dedication that goes into it. But to be offering like the alleged sexual favours to get a <laughs> higher mark in for their students, I was just going, what They've been God. offered for less, I'd say. I'm I've be had two girls in Irish dancing for 15 years after they won a dance competition. The rules were changed. This is because schools are so jealous about each other. I spent thousands, yeah, thousands. on dancing costumes, shoes, glue, wigs, and it's not a fair competition. It's who you know and what you can do. So tell me, oh. so with that story, is it they were, they were accused and then they were still allowed to judge? Is yes, that yes. that's another, yes, that's another, that's another facet part of, it. of it. Okay, yeah. right, okay. The, there's a, it's a big, like Ellen Coyle has this exclusive in uh, the, the, Irish, the Irish Independent. It's really interesting. It's well worth reading. Um, um, I can't get over the scandal around Irish dancing. I'm 30 and would have competed from the ages of 8 to 14. And it was very competitive, all right, plus the costs involved. I'd say my parents were delighted but I eventually gave it up. <laughs> <laughs> in favour of Gaelic football. And that's the thing, they're paying, shelling out so much oh, money yeah, for the, the dresses wigs, and the everything wigs, else. Have, everything. You ever, have you ever tried one of the wigs on yeah. for kids? They're yeah. so heavy on yeah. the neck. For the white kids to do Irish dancing, a large proportion, I suppose, the fake tan. Oh, like yeah. Like when you're five years now, old, I have to maybe qualify that much fake why tan. I did try an Irish dancing wig on. Yeah, why would <laughs> I'm <laughs> sorry. It just seemed you, perfectly you, normal to me. I was going me. to say that you didn't even did say the dress why, on as well. <laughs> that would also seem no, perfectly normal to it me. It was a skid and panto. But you didn't. You just brushed over <laughs> that. Sammy yeah. Sausages. Or Alan would be wearing an Irish dancing Sammy wig. Sammy Sausages, <laughs> you've done everything. We should mention as well... Uh, Loads of messages about the About dyslexia. dyslexia. Yeah. It is, of course, uh, World Dyslexia Day. And we're trying throughout the show, we have lots of features features on it and we have messages in here. I was diagnosed at the age of 44. My daughter is dyslexic as well. However, primary school teachers need to educate themselves. I was told, don't be surprised if dyslexia is gone by fifth class. Funniest thing I've ever heard. But we were just chatting about it. And actually, the, no, the figures are quite startling. One in 10 mm. children, they reckon, have dyslexia. Mm. And just the amount of messages we're getting in about being diagnosed late, we'd love to hear from you. We're going to get yeah. to as many messages as we can a little bit later on 0896 111 Thanks for that. Now, and we'll get a picture of Alan in his wig. At a break, <laughs> former government minister Shane Ross is going to be here to talk about his book on Mary Lou MacDonald. That's after the break. Now, our next guest is a former government minister who is the author of four best-selling books on Irish politics. In his latest work, he calls Mary Lou MacDonald a Republican riddle. Shane Ross, welcome to the show. Thank, Thank you for you joining us. Thank you. Why did you choose Mary Lou MacDonald to be the subject of your next political book? She just seemed so obvious as a choice for a, for, for a biography. She, she's the most fascinating, charismatic and powerful person. She's to poised to be Taoiseach. She's going to be the... If she makes it, she's going to be the first woman Taoiseach. She's going to be the first Sinn Féin minister. She's the, she's, she, she is the woman of the moment, and she's on the verge of a historic breakthrough. Whether it'll happen or not, I don't know, but she's obviously very, very important, both north and south of the border. Mm. So this, it's a biography. What sort of cooperation did you have with Mary Lou around this book? I thought I was going to get lots. Really? But I didn't get any. It was, I, I know her well, and I like her, and, and so I went to see her, and... Um, <coughs> 
And I asked her, would she just... I didn't want it to be an authorised biography, because obviously then you get compromised. But I asked her, would she introduce her, me to members of her family? I want to know about her childhood. You know, she's a mystery. That's why we call her a riddle now. And I wanted to get stories of what she was like as a child, as a teenager, education. And I asked her, would she do that? And she said she'd come back to me in a week. And she, uh, she went off and she thought about it and she came back and said she wouldn't, actually. She said, mm. I won't stand in your way, but I won't cooperate and help. I mean, okay. would you be surprised that she'd say no? Yes. You know, given the fact you're a journalist, Sunday well, Independent, you yeah. know, really to let the, the, a person like a hack into your life like that? Well, I was going to do it anyway, right? So it wouldn't frustrate me doing the book. And, and what, what I was surprised in some ways. I was surprised because, because I, I would have thought she respected my integrity, my independence, uh, and that it would be to her advantage to, to introduce, you know, aspects of her life which were, which were beneficial to a, a positive story. I wasn't surprised in the other way because I know Sinn Féin liked to control the message. And this is the problem that I've had, had with the book, but I, we, we overcame it. But can, Sinn Féin don't like other people writing about a book like this where they don't control the message, and that's, yeah. I think, that what happened. I, I think that's, that can be... With a serving politician, yeah. that can certainly be the case, yeah. you know, because you have to control the message. We're yeah. in a world of spin doctors and closely guarded and, and, and being like, this is what you're going to say yeah. right now. Yeah. If they could do that with Liz Truss in the UK, it might help them a little bit more. Yeah. But here, you can understand why that would happen. And yeah. the thing is about Mary Lou MacDonald, you mentioned something there, and it's charisma. Not only yeah. that she's probably the smartest person in every room, yeah. but it's, it's the charisma that she has. Everyone yeah. knows that she was originally with Fianna Fáil. Yeah. She moved to Sinn Féin. And, and then I suppose you're right, we don't know a huge amount else no. about about Mary Lou and do you think that there is this appetite yes to know m more about her and, and what did you find out that the public don't know oh I mean there's definitely appetite it's there I, I come across it every single day that I, I talk to people about her they want to know about her childhood they want to know about her education the, the mystery of Mary Lou the first mystery certainly of Mary Lou is how did someone who came from Rathgar which is a well-off Dublin middle-class suburb who, who also is privately educated, how does she end up as actually leader of Sinn Féin? It's such an unlikely path, such an unlikely journey. And that, I think, we, 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 we address very, very fully in the book. And we look into, into her background, which is very important of any biography at all. Her father, her mother, her parents, her siblings, all that, all that comes out. Her education. She was, you know, she was a private, she was a private convent in Churchtown. She then went to, uh, to Trinity College, Dublin. And the second question, which I think we addressed there, which was really interesting to me, is when did she, her republicanism really develop? And there was no sign of that republicanism. Now, she kind of retrofits it a bit. She says she was very, very uh, upset by the, by the hunger strikes, which everybody was, yeah. and the death of Bobby Sands when she was 12. And that is absolutely acceptable. But then, she's, then nothing happens. Each, she went through secondary school and through Trinity College, Dublin, where there were opportunities for budding politicians or people interested in current affairs, she didn't get involved so, at all. So uh, do you think that... Is she a true believer in Sinn Féin? Or do you think, she, is she an opportunist? That's the, third, that's the third question. And that's the really, really big one. And what do you think? Um, I leave it to the readers in the end, but I lay it out very, very ob obviously. Um, very, very, very clearly indeed. I think that the United Ireland message that she has now is very definitely something which she feels. Uh -huh. when, okay. she was, when she was in Fianna Fáil, she was un not very happy because they weren't enthusiastic crusaders for a united Ireland. And she caused mayhem in Fianna Fáil, according to the people I talked to in Fianna Fáil, uh, by saying to them, you're not Republican enough. Mm -hmm. uh, and she gives that as the reason for leaving, right? Uh, because she wanted to join a really true Republican party. The sceptics say, and this is a very important point, that it was a very clever career move, that she saw an opening there in Sinn Féin for a middle-class woman. Sinn Féin were changing their image, they were trying to leave the armed struggle behind them. The Good Friday Agreement was, was signed, yeah. and they wanted... What could be better than that? She's really? an opportunist. Well, that's yeah. exactly well, what you just well, said. Well, okay, yeah. Yeah. No, I'm saying that's, that's that one side. Yeah. The other side is, yeah, she has a Republican... She had a nationalist parents. She had both mother and father who were in Fianna Fáil, or who were... Been for loyalists or yeah. nationalists. So she had a background there as, as well. But she seemed to have lost it when she was about 12. 
till she was about 20, 28. Well, isn't that the nature of professional politics? Yeah. Because she is so smart mm. that she has gotten to set the agenda for a political party that has gone legit, yeah. like that has gone really, really legitimate. And so it's sort of, OK, I can see this party. They, they will come along with my values, my beliefs, what yeah. I, how I think the, the, the country should be structured economically. Yeah. Uh, I can set the agenda there, that it was actually brilliant and that the republicanism can be second because she is it's a new political party under her that's quite possible but you know i mean she she came she joined Sinn Féin around the year 2000. There's a doubt about it when she joined Sinn Féin that's all in the book it's a mysterious uh, transition but she was handpicked she was a great fit she was spotted by adams and she and he was she was the exactly what he wanted adams wanted someone to change the image from from the old from the old militarist veteran yep. IRA guys, and he this was a perfect fit, and so she saw it as well. Now that may be opportunism, but it doesn't mean she wasn't a believer. A, a, a big thing that I that I've seen has come out of this book uh, yeah. over the weekend, whatever, is about this. You have turned a, a mansion you've, out of a molehill, really, on this one. <laughs> yeah, that she had this bungalow. You're questioning where yeah. did the money come from yeah. for a five bedroom. Mansion, yeah. as you call it, is it a mansion? Have you come to terms? Have you have you worked out? The oh how yeah, this is the, done? the changes, and I got I got three builders to look at it. You see, the planning permission is all in the book. It's a massive change. It's a huge tr structural change. The, the house was d almost demolished, and the, and the photographs are there if you want to show. And them. it doesn't add up. Then is this what you're well, saying? Hold on, it's just like a Dermot Bannon house. Honestly, like having looked at the pictures, it's like what's been done to houses all yeah, over, that's right. all over yeah. the but country. Where did you yeah. fund it? Is that well, the question? Well, what I'm, oh, I'm, I'm not implying anything, but I am asking a question which politicians get all the time. And I got three estimates, and they said it's at least half a million refurbishments here. Where did the money come from? That's a fair question because we've had we've had those questions to politicians all the time, and she's going to get that before she's Taoiseach. She's she's going to get that when she's Taoiseach. People saying to her. Where did the money come from that, for the house? And all she has to Everybody's say, questioned that with her yeah. all the time, and we, we saw that with the budget there recently as yeah. well. But she's fantastic in opposition, yes, which has been incredible. You, of course, yeah. were this person as well in yeah. your political yeah. career too. Yeah. And then you went into yeah. Then you went into your I course sold, of minister I sold out, did I? as an independent. Yeah, yeah. Well, I don't know. Did you sell out? <laughs> no. How difficult is it to get things through? Very. Did you enjoy being a politician? Yes, very much so, because you can get things done. But it's, it's, it's not as quick as you think. What, the lessons you learn when you become a minister, you're asking about the turnover and saying I was in opposition. It's not as quick. You demand things in opposition. You do it with every, you know, with every good intention, every expectation of it happening. I never really expected to be a minister. I was a kind of accidental minister. But, but when it happened, you could get some things done, but there are all sorts of checks and balances and delays which stop you. You're only one member of a cabinet. You can't immediately, you know, I wanted to change the judiciary and the way they selected judges. The opposition to that was just incredible, despite the pledges within the government. It had people who were determined not constant to Constant delays of civil servants. Yes, I... as well as that. I mean, the civil service is the most conservative. They are lovely, great people. They have a fund of knowledge which is unparalleled and really But they don't like anything done. They don't like change. They just don't want things to change. But they then does that mean way. that we are governed, <clears throat> essentially, that the politicians that we vote for who are sitting in the doll <coughs> are, you know, it's it's a phallic victory, you know, it's it, it, a pyrrhic victory that you're there, but it's actually the civil servants who control everything, like who control the, the purse strings and what we want to get done. I think the politicians make this, the big decisions Right, but the, the civil servants are the people who really implement them, and if they don't want to implement them, they can make it very, very difficult for them. And the do politics. you think that's bad? Do you think that we need to reform that? Well, I think yes. I mean, civil servants have a huge this, this bank of knowledge, which is absolutely priceless, and they are very, very generous with it, and they're very, very useful in that way. But they do have it in their capacity to delay you doing things. You know, they don't want you to do something. They can insist that there isn't the money. Other cabinet ministers can be got involved to oppose you as well. They have all sorts of very devious ways of stopping things. So you've got, that should, that should be, you know, it should be hastening. It's so frustrating yeah. as a politician when you're trying to get something across. If you were to go to do it again, would yeah. you do anything different in um, your political career? I, I, think, I think I would have, you know, <laughs> that's a very difficult question because it's been, it's been a very, I hope, you know, positive political career. Yeah, I suppose I'd, <laughs> I suppose what I'd do is I would have, I would have, Tried to get a mainstream 
politics earlier. I was 39 years in politics, and I wasn't a minister till the last five. So yeah. I, was, I was 34 years in opposition. Mm. And that's the wrong way. The wrong way to do it. I was. It was too late, really, to come to to come to be a minister. I should have been tried to be a minister about twenty years earlier. Yeah. I think that to get things done. And what I did was left at the end of my career and left a lot, a lot of unfinished business, like on the judges and uh, and other things, which I would have liked to have finished when I was there. Mm. But it, I was frustrated by time. Really. And there, and but there is one thing that you did leave with that you did leave us with, yes. which we will always appreciate. What's that? And that is you and sports people and the the picture opportunities, <laughs> which we loved all the time. I don't know if I need to put Tommy in front of you there now. There you are, Katie Taylor. Like honestly, Shane, <laughs> there is a super cut of you going around with sports stars, and I absolutely adored it. What did you make of you becoming a superstar? for this sort of stuff on, uh, uh, for people going on and on. Look at this! You're running over again. <laughs> what did you make look, of that at the time? Because it went, like, it was all over social media. Uh, that, there I was getting out of the way there, being modest. <laughs> uh, I don't think so. Politi <laughs> politicians. Politicians. I was shameless that day. I you... mean, I, I was absolutely shameless. But you have to make use of your opportunities. That's what I'm doing now. I, I, I'm actually coming up well, and saying, look, I want to be on there to, 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 to get people to buy the book. Shane Ross, Fair you play absolutely to. did. Listen, Can we get you into an Ireland jersey? Yeah, we're we're all back time and we'll get, get a picture, get a picture, picture of you, you with him. Uh, Nobody well, doesn't like it most. Your new book, of course, Mary Lou MacDonald, A Republican Riddle. Um, you know, you have a list of bestsellers. Congratulations yeah. on the new book. And uh, it's you. great to have you with us. Thank you for having me on. Thank you. Welcome back. Now, throughout the morning, we're raising awareness around the issue of dyslexia. And Derek is at a school in Greystones in County Wicklow to see how they're supporting their dyslexic students. Good morning, Derek. Yes, good morning, Al. We're live here down at Greystones Community National School right across the morning. We're here to tie in with their Dyslexia Awareness Week here in the school. And joining us now is Vice Principal Jean Darcy. Good morning to you, Jean. Jean, how common is dyslexia amongst primary school children? Um, well... Good morning, Derek. How are you? We would kind of see maybe one in ten in Ireland that have dyslexia. And I suppose the numbers range in the school here as well. We might see more than that in some classes or less, but we do have a huge number here that are dyslexic themselves. Now let's yeah. get into the diagnosis. So where what are the early signs? What are the early indicators? Now, uh, us as teachers, if we were looking out, we kind of see it quite young in children. You're looking out for phonological awareness. If they're not actually grasping their phonics when they're quite small, if they're not grasping reading, their work and memory isn't up to speed as others, kind of word processing delays, things like that are the early indicators that we might see in a child. Handwriting is also a big one that might indicate to us. So we kind of have a range of things we look out for, but usually we'd kind of see it by first class here. Now, there is, there is a scale as well. Mm. Some can be mild, yeah. some can go all the way mm. up to severe as mm. well. Yeah, and we would have a range of that here in the school as well. And even with the children here this morning, some of them, their handwriting is amazing and others are on the other end of the scale. So we see it differently in children, but we would treat them all the same just with the supports that we do give them. Nadia, you're a special education teacher here in the school. In terms of resources, because there is a squeeze in teachers, there's a squeeze in SNAs in many schools right up and down the country. Yeah. How are you coping at the moment? Um, look, ideally, you'd love if the class sizes were halved and we all had more time with the children, but we do our best. Um, we have a really close relationship. As the set teacher, I do work closely with the class teacher. Um, we would do, you know, we follow specific programmes such as toe by toe here. We do touch typing for the children who find handwriting difficult and they need to use their assistive technology. We teach like explicit phonics um, to the children. They need that a lot. We give in-class support because that can really benefit the children who have mild dyslexia and they like being in the class with their classmates. And then for children who have more needs and gaps in their learning that we have to target, we take them out. And you have a very close relationship with the parents as well. That's Extremely very, that's vital. close. To be honest, you know, the parents might come to us. Parents can spot. They see things at home that we mightn't see. So they really, when we're putting our plans together for the children, we draw on, you know, information from the parents a lot and um, we'll see how they are in school but we mightn't see the anxiety at home or some of the children their self-esteem would be really low and they're you know trying to mask that in school because they want to be like their peers and at home the frustration is coming out so that's an area we look at as well it's not just you know bringing them up to speed with their reading or writing it's also looking after their you know their self-esteem and confidence and that's what this week is about as well just 
trying to make sure that they have a belief in themselves and that they should be aware that while dyslexia is challenging that, it shouldn't hold them back from achieving what they want to achieve. All right, Gina and Tara, thank you so much for chatting to us. Now we're going to pop over here to some of the kids. And first up, we've got Julia. And Julia, how do you feel or how did you feel when you were first diagnosed? Um, when I was first diagnosed, I did feel kind of embarrassed and I felt like I wasn't smart as my classmates. But then over the years, I've kind of realised that there's nothing to be ashamed of or embarrassed. It's just something you need to be proud of. And just because, you know, you're slower at some things doesn't mean that you won't achieve anything. Absolutely. You're getting lots of help and support here in the school. I said, what's helped you with your obstacles? Well, we did lots of school programmes, like with some of the kids who had dyslexia, like Toe by Toe and Snip, and I was just helping with our reading and writing and stuff. And I've been doing it for quite a few years. And you feel much more confident down, do you? Yeah, yeah uh, it's gotten better. Like. Good boy, step by step, absolutely. Uh, Isabel as well, how do you feel uh, compared to when you were first diagnosed? How do you feel now? I feel that I have improved more in my reading and writing and spelling. And I feel that I'm stronger. Stronger, in much more confident. And so much so, you won the Write a Book competition. Yeah. Did you give a round of applause. Yeah, you're the boss. Good girl. And we pop over here to you, Ruben. And what do you think, having dyslexia, would that stop you from achieving your dreams, Ruben? Uh, no. Oh, uh, I have lots of strengths. I just process information slightly differently. And it's the same with all dyslexic people. And I want to be a paleontologist. And there are loads of dyslexic paleontologists. And, you know, that's inspiring. And there's absolutely nothing to stop you being a paleontologist, is there? No. No, absolutely. No. Good boy. That's the attitude we love to hear. And we're going to swing around here to Alex. And Alex, you use a little laptop here in the school as well, don't you? Yeah. And how do you find that? It really helps me out a lot when I am writing. And it's really, well, just kind of just... A bit easier. It makes it all a bit easier. And, of course, you have great support here in the school and great support from mum and dad as well, don't you? Yeah. And not only that, but I hear you're a great little baker, aren't you? What have we got here this morning? You've got your little cock and millet. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Did you make that at home? Yeah. And it's got dyslexia on it as well. Yeah. And what do you want to be when you grow older? A chef. You want to be a chef just like mum. So there we have it, guys. Great reaction here from the kids. As it shows, dyslexia isn't a barrier to progressing in life at school or indeed later life, as I mentioned. You can check out dyslexia.ie for more information. But for now, kids, are you looking forward to Halloween? Yeah! Back to you in the studio. Good oh, man, Derek. Oh, that was fantastic. Yeah. Alex, Ruben, Isabel, Sebastian, Julia as well. How well did they speak? Amazing. Yeah, On amazing, camera, yeah. so confident the as well. The classroom was gorgeous. Isn't so it? colourful. It's lovely to see that. And we've been receiving your messages about dyslexia this morning. And a message that says, my sister was in her second year in college before being diagnosed with dyslexia after her lecture asked her was she ever assessed. Dyslexia needs to be more recognised in society. My sister tried to do the driver theory test but failed three times. There was no help or assistance for anyone. This surely needs to be Here's a good one yes. though. My son was diagnosed at eight, just before he headed into third class. It was tough, but to be fair, his school were fantastic. He's 19 now and getting on with life, he's just completed his leaving cert. And while to some that might not seem a huge deal, Believe me, it was a major achievement considering the level of difficulties. Mm. Uh, it can be so much to do with the learning support they receive. And in our case, we were really fortunate with both primary and secondary schools. Yeah. I think that says it all, really, it's doesn't great. it? And, and people are getting more support than ever in dyslexia.ie, as we said. Go over and, and, and look at that. So thank you, Derek, for that. Now, after the break, we're heading to the Mediterranean. Oh, yes. yes. Some ta homemade oh. tortellini. Well, tortellini is on the menu. Well, like, yeah. Yeah. You'll get to hear that accent for the next eight minutes. <laughs> Talk to you in a minute. Inspired by nature, powered by light. Beko Harvest Fresh sponsors cookery on Ireland AM. Now we've got the stretchy pants on because we're going to need them. <laughs> <laughs> have you got the stretchy pants on? Sure OK. Alberto Rossi is in the kitchen from the Intercontinental, uh, Intercontinental Hotel. Good morning to you, Alberto. Good morning, Alan. Good Tortellini. morning, Tommy. How are we? Yes, tortellini. Fantastic. With spinach and ricotta served in the rombrot. In Italian, you call it differently, but it says, you know, tortellini <laughs> di magro in brodo, you know, because no. they are served with the stock. 
Chicken stock or chicken, chicken stock. stock? Chicken stock, then we flavored a little bit with some Parmesan cheese. So in this case, now I have the tortellini in already because they take about five minutes to cook. Okay. Great. So it's just plain chicken stock that you can buy the cube and yeah. put it in the water. And then all you have to do is make sure you taste it a good couple of times with a spoon that it's salted correctly. I saw you, you kept tasting the yeah, broth. Because you're serving it with it. So if you're serving something that is insipid, that has no salt oh, yeah. or anything, it will affect the whole dish. Right. Very important. Every time you do something with the stock, the stock is adding the flavor. So you're, so you're going to show us how to, yeah. to make the tortellini. So I have the pasta already cut into rounds. I used a, a glass. Just Very a glass, easy. Okay. Everybody has it. You can have all the fancy cutter like I do, but you know, yeah. the yeah, glass always simple. works. Then you need a mixing bowl. I need a spoon. So this is ricotta cheese. Okay. Ricotta cheese, very light cheese that doesn't have much of the flavor, so it tends itself to accommodate any flavor that you add. Okay. Then I have spinach. I just put it in a pan with a little bit of oil, uh, cook them a bit, salt, squeeze the water out, oh, and chop them. Okay. Is that the way you would normally make spinach? If you were making yeah. spinach, you'd just put it into a pan. Exactly, and do it. with yeah. oil and salt yeah. and everything, you know? And so, did you blitz that in the blender or did you no, just chop no, it? No, no, I was here a minute ago and I just chopped it with a knife. So it doesn't okay. have to be finely chopped, oh, okay. you know, it's, it's just chopped. Then I have Parmesan cheese that I grated okay. and I put it in there too, okay? okay? Then just a pinch of salt to make sure, because I say ricotta is quite insipid. Then this is nutmeg. Very important in Italian cooking. Oh, okay. Very small. People wouldn't know usually what to do with the nutmeg. No. Nutmeg works very well. You just grate it in and it gives great flavor. We also use it in gnocchi and a lot of works oh, with gnocchi, potato. Yeah. Yeah. I nutmeg made this is very, before, very good. And uh, nutmeg definitely wasn't in the no, recipe. No, I wouldn't have wouldn't thought nutmeg at all. Oh, nutmeg is, uh, is fantastic. It's fantastic. Like then you mix it. Or something. Sorry, yeah, yeah. You mix it. You can add so a little bit of filling. olive oil. Yeah. Put in a little of olive oil, and then you come with a mix already done. In this case, I have it done here, so you can see it's quite thick and yeah. pasty. I put it inside a little piping bag, so we can serve it nicely. Then you have your egg yolk. So you have your little round of pasta, and you just put a little bit on the lip. Okay, okay. So on one side. Yeah, you don't go all around it, otherwise it doesn't stick. And then I put in a little bit of the filling, okay? And I bend it like this, so I make like a... a Half moon, right? And then that's where the skill comes in. Okay. Oh, you bend it up. Yeah, I figured I could do this. You bend it up and you put it around the finger, like this. Okay. You know. So and, and then you come up with all of them. Oh, yeah. Look at the size you, you of know, them. Can I have a go? You can make them all small look or big. You know? Can I have a go? Yeah. So right. Right. first a little so. bit, just a little bit. Yes. Otherwise it, 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 okay. it lies. Right. And then you put in a little bit. Okay. You go in. So fold it fold over. Fold up first. Fold over first. Right, so okay. make a half moon. Exactly, yeah. and you make sure you, you tap it so it closes. Yeah. Okay, yeah. And then... Fold over again. Fold over again, so you see that it comes up, and you put it around your finger. You have to put it around your finger, Tom. Yeah. Oh, no. You stretch it a bit, <laughs> yeah. yeah. What it's a skin, again? you know, there it is. Look at that. Show, we, show, been your doing them. show your one there, just there. put it on the palm of your hand. Look I've been that. doing so, them for a long time. See, so it fold up and then go and then you bend the it, finger. Yes. So you do like this, look, you fold it, oh, and then oh, you go around bent. and you pull it up like that. Mine's so. burst already. And if it bursts, it's no good. It'll, it's no good it'll... because it'll break in and it'll break oh, up. So, no. I no so this is the skill them. bit. So if you're trying to make these at home, you have to uh, take a... But hand, it's okay right? if you make them bigger. Now, as I said, these are called tortellini. So the any part of the word means that it's the small part. Show me small. one more go how you did that. Just one, like, let me see. <laughs> what did I do wrong? I don't put the feeling, okay? So okay. But you do like this. Yeah. Fold it. And then you see you put your finger in like that because it needs to come up. Yeah, but when and do you get the finger in then to, to go wrap? There, he wraps it around wraps your around finger. It and throws See, it. You wrap it around Now, my fingers finger. are quite big, but a lot of people, especially around Modena or Bologna, where they come from, they do it around their pinky finger because oh. it's small. Cool. Right? Okay. So the, and then you can make them bigger. So you can make them bigger, a bigger version of it. Yeah. And they're called tortelli. And okay. I was saying that you can also, if you want to add a little bit of ham or something, yeah, you can, you chop can do up them. some ham and do that in it Absolutely. as well. Absolutely, you can put in the ham, and, and they don't have to be served with the stock. The version I'm doing is served with the stock, but you can serve them with tomato sauce or pesto or anything. No, like. But even Brilliant. if you put That's the ham in, would you some. not serve it with the stock? No. Yeah, you could. Oh you yeah. Could okay. Indeed. Yeah. So now I have it here ready. I have the tortellini ready. They are cooked, and I put so just a little quick? bit of pasta. It yeah, you because wouldn't... you you made the pasta just now, so it's fresh. You know, if you buy it, even if you buy it in any of the shop, and they come from the fridge, it'll tell you cooking time three minutes. Wow, three so minutes! Once, yeah, yeah. yeah no, it is very fast. There. But this is interesting. So it's kind of served as a soup almost. Yes, because uh, usually this is eaten around uh, Christmas. So, Christmas. Yeah, this is a Christmas dish in my house because my mom is Irish and my father is Italian. I have a mix 
We do smoked salmon tartlets, and then we do all the cured meats, and then we do tortellini. So this would be a starter, then, would it? Mm. Well, it's a mid-size. You know, you start with all your cured meats, and, you know, uh, you have some mm. uh, grilled vegetables and pickles and stuff like that, and then you have your past, and then your mix. Would you ever serve this in the hotel? We did before. So you'd we have did. to make hundreds of them every morning? That's why you guys come in and pay the money you pay. <laughs> <laughs> it's, so, I tell you, it's so light. It's, it's light, so... and, and, and the flavour of the stock. If you don't have mm. the flavour of the stock, you taste nothing. Yeah. Because you only have ricotta, spinach and nutmeg, so it's a very light dish. Yeah. Keeps so, you warm. It is, yeah. So you have parmesan, you have chicken stock, and what was the, the, parsley. the herbs? Parsley, parsley. Is, you know, it makes it nice and bright. Um, makes Alberto. It... Alberto Fab. Rossi from the Inter Intercontinental Hotel, thank you so much, No Fab. problem, thank thank you. No problem. Now, coming up the final hour, we're going to be reviewing some new uh, movie releases. Plus, Fair Cities, Ryan Andrews is going to be here. We'll see you after the short break. Inspired by nature, powered by light. Beko Harvest Fresh, sponsors cookery on Ireland AM. Welcome back to Ireland AM. Now, we're talking about the front page of the Irish Independent. This is an exclusive story uh, by Ellen Coyne, who's done an investigation into Irish dancing, and it's proven that it is fraught with controversies with 12 judges, not just based in Ireland, we don't know where, offering to, um, they want competitions fixed. Yeah, how cheating claims are rocking the world of Irish dancing. Um, it's now, just... We have got a message in, though, from, uh, I presume, another... A dance teacher as well. Don't tar all with the same brush. There are Irish dancing organisations that put the protection of the dancers first. I've been dancing all my life and now teaching. Unfortunately, some don't care about the hard work these kids put in. It's all about money to them. I will never put money before the love of dancing. Well, fair, I, absolutely. I mean, yeah, Irish dancing is huge. But it, I know it, in this country, you, it when is. When you see huge. something like this, but it's not like it's big business in China and it's big business in the but US. It's not big business oh, well, here as such. Really, like, like that's what we're saying. And somebody here, I'm agreeing with Alan. At the end of the day, it's just a trophy. Um, I used to do Irish dancing, and honestly, I can say I was uh, the big winner of the highly recommended. 100% agree with Alan. It's just a trophy, and at the end of the day. Um, it's, it's, it is a fair competition, but you wouldn't need to be shelling out as much money on outfits should it not be all about, um, like, the competition itself. Okay, I got it wasn't I've... a tro trophy to me. Whenever I was growing up, not for dancing, but for everything. Do you know what I mean? Like, there's the oh, competitiveness. Oh, no, the love and the competitiveness yeah. of it. But, like, when we saw earlier on about what these teachers were prepared to do to get their students higher marks, to win a competition where you would eventually just get a trophy. Like, we were talking about offering sexual people, favours. But these people lead on to going into river dance, to opening up their own schools, and to become a judge is very hard, and there is money involved in that. Like, I received a message this morning... Would you offer sexual been... favours to somebody because they get a job ah, in no, river dance? Of course stupid, not. Mirren. I'm I mean, not, that'd be like, you, I mean, come on. But I'm just saying that this is a world <laughs> that we don't understand, but for people who are involved in it, I got a message this morning from someone who is very high in the Irish dancing world and says that this, there is really bad scandalous you, stuff going you, on there. You are really into this, aren't you? I like, am really into this. I have like, actually been into this stuff for a while. I think that there's mad stuff in is the there ma is there Is there more than we're seeing now, yes, even on this? I would is say there so. a whole, like, movie to be made on... It seems like it, because it's Irish taken dance. A, a huge... Like, Listen that's a this. massive front page spread yeah. on the end of this morning. Good morning, Ireland Day. I'm regarding the Irish dancing uh, story. It's not new at all. This was going on in my day in the 1960s. Nothing has changed. Uh, the same thing is happening with Irish dancing in the States. Um, in one particular instance, a note was put under the bedroom door of a hotel um, uh, for the post person. It was put under the wrong door. It was the opposition judge's door. Uh, so basically they had tried to sort asking, something out. Doing stuff. Anyway, it's been going listen, on for a long time. I suppose it's like anything messages. in every competition. Listen, it's not just Irish dancing that uh, goes on in all sorts when of you things. See, so. When you, you see those beauty competitions, those children's beauty competitions in America and everything like that, the things that the parents are willing to do to get their child. Send in your text yeah. messages. We'll try and get through as many of them as we can. We're going to be talking about movies in the cinema. That's coming up after the break. <laughs> Oh, 
You're looking for a good film to get stuck into this weekend. Our movie man, the train driver, Brian Lloyd, is here. <laughs> hey! <laughs> Brian is able to drive a train. We should just mention that. That's that's I'm, why you said that. Please, We're going yeah. to stop now. Do yeah, you know what please. we'll do first? Yes. We're going to look at our first movie. Let's take a look at the new period comedy mystery by David O. Russell. Here's Amsterdam. I never expected two decorated soldiers to get knocked out of my own home. No, just one, sir. Oh, well, that's right, Mr. Woodman. You were too fast for Carlton. I was. They started talking to Valerie, and she's not well, and please, darling girl, stop crying. It's only natural for her to cry, baby. She just found out her friend is dead. We couldn't keep it from her for forever. I'm not so ill that I can't talk to people. You leave me here with this invalid when you know very well that I think she Maybe. should be hospitalized. It's for her own she good. Ever say that to me I again. can't handle well, it. I'll, I'll put be a you in a hospital. You. I'll yeah. send you to a witch Please. trial. Here. Ladies, stop. Tommy devastated that Margot isn't a blonde in it. Margot Robbie isn't a blonde yeah. in it. So the story is Margot Robbie is a brunette. That's it. And we're done that's with the movie. That's basically gotcha. the whole film. Yeah, it's so talk about what it. is Amsterdam about? Oh, right. So it's based on this uh, real life uh, conspiracy that happened in 1933 where these uh, business leaders in America basically tried to bring in fascism. Um, now, this is sort of based on it, but really what's going on in Amsterdam is it's, it's very chaotic, caper comedy kind of thing where Christian Bale and John David Washington and Margot Robbie uncover this, again, this conspiracy, plot. Yeah. this plot. But it's not really about that. It's more about them kind of like finding themselves and, you know, the idea of like weirdos can come together and change the world and all that sort of thing. But David O. Russell, like he did, you know, Three Kings, but then he did I Heart Huckabees. Mm -hmm. And then he which did... Which made nothing. Yeah, exactly. But his last film was Joy, which was that one with Jennifer Lawrence. And that was... Where she was 23 and played a 40-something-year-old woman. Exactly, yeah. And like, there's a lot of stuff come out about David O. Russell that he's like apparently just insane on set and roars at people and all the rest of it and likes to keep a chaotic set. Now, does that impact on the film? Yes, it does, because when you watch this film, you're confused for literally, like, 75% of it. You oh. really don't know what's going on with it because it's trying to do, like, 10 things at once. Like, in one scene, it can be really, really funny, and then another scene... And then, literally, in the same scene, someone gets shot dead, and you're like, what's going on, and then it turns out that it's actually a dream sequence. Oh. Yeah. So if David Russell as a director makes being on set difficult, how yeah. did he get, like, the names? Yeah. Christian Bale, Margot Robbie, John David Washington, Chris Rock, Rami Malek, Mike Myers, Taylor Swift. Like, an incredible cast. Oh, yeah, cast. a huge cast, yeah. And I think the reason why he gets a lot of these people is because they literally turn up for, like, 90 seconds or three minutes. That's it. It's literally just they come by, wave at the camera, do their scene and then they're gone. Like Taylor oh, Swift is barely okay. in it. Taylor Swift is in two scenes. Um, Robert De Niro has talked about it in the entire film, but he only turns up in like the last 15 minutes. Chris Rock, he just has that one scene oh, there. Yeah, right. that's it. Yeah, like it's it's all just like literally like kind of cameos and stuff like that, which is, you know, again, it's very impressive when you see this big, huge cast, but then when you realise most of them are only in it for like five, 10 minutes. I'm, I'm just wondering because David O. Russell, he does win awards for people. You know, he, yeah. he he does Christian Bale, yeah. Amy Adams, um, he the fighter, uh, silver, sil the oh, fighter super silver lining playbook, silver and playbook um, American Hustle. He wins awards, right? He does. Are three but, great movies. Yeah, yeah. But, the, but the thing is, George Clooney has come out about Three Kings and said this man is a terrible human yeah. being. It was filmed him going off at Lily Tomlinson during mm. I Heart Huckabee's, and we do live in a different world where yeah. this this auteur. It doesn't it's work not anymore. A nice, and it's and it's now transcending into his films that like would you would, do you think people should go to this? I mean, like it's I suppose I don't know I don't know if I enjoyed it to be honest, because like it's okay. so kind of chaotic, like and it's so all over the place. I mean, yes, that's the thing. The performances are brilliant in it. Christian Bale, obviously brilliant in it. Margot Robbie, she's kind of getting to play with a big cast instead of either leading a cast or being, you know, the kind of love interest or whatever. You get to see a bit more range in it. I think she I think David O. Russell does bring out interest in performances and people, but his films generally tend to be less than the people that are in it. Now okay. do you know what I mean? Have you got a star rating for Two out of five. Okay, but you weren't even too sure I wasn't even about sure it. about that. It's not great, to be Okay, honest. let's move on to the next one. So, Sinead O'Connor's brought out a yeah. documentary. Yes, nothing compares. Yeah, this is incredible. And I mean, it's yeah. one of those... Yeah, no, it really is. And I think when you watch this documentary, I think it's one of those things... Sinead O'Connor deserves 
a huge apology from yes. everybody because like you watch some of the interviews that are done in this and it's not just like Gay Byrne and the Late Late Show but I'm talking like when she was on like American TV shows and stuff like that and the questions that she was being asked and there is this thing now of like a lot of like pop stars from the 90s are having these sort of I suppose reappraisals of what they had to go through yeah, in that yeah. time period. You know, and Sinead O'Connor, I think, is the prime example of this. You know, right up until the SNL incident, like she was everywhere. So the SNL incident was that where she tore up the where picture she tore of up the, the picture of Joe Pom, Joe Pom, Joe uh, Pope. Pope John Paul II. You can tell I'm a Protestant. Um, <laughs> and it's, it's all weird to me. But um, yeah, when she tore up a picture of um, Pope John Paul II, I mean that was nine years before the Catholic Church publicly acknowledged that there were child sexual abuse. Because that, that was her okay. protest. Because was that was her protest, sexual. and she knew of it herself. She talks about it in the documentary that she was basically placed in like this ward. Uh, where there was Magdalene women there wow. and left to sleep overnight yeah. by a nun to warn her, like, this is what will happen to you if you keep speaking out. Um, I mean... This is a short period of time. Obviously, yeah. Sinead O'Connor is is someone who is, who's in our bones, I, I yeah. would say, in Ireland. And Definitely. People care for her an awful yeah. lot. But this is a period of time from her rise to stardom yeah, to, uh, to the Saturday Night Live incident. Yeah. Where it, so it's a very short period of time. Five years, it is, yeah. 87 to 92. Yeah. yeah, that's right, yeah. And how do they deal with this? Do we get to hear, we get to hear from Sinead in her own Yeah, words? Oh, absolutely, yeah. From yeah. people who knew her, from her ex-husband, John Reynolds, does a lot of interviews in it as well. And that's the other thing about it. You can really see that the relationship that they had was really, really special. And they were so young and so in love. and. Knowing what comes then afterwards, it makes it just all the more kind of heartbreaking and stuff. But yeah, you hear from her, Roshan Ingle is in it as well. Her publicists were in it. So there's a range of people in it, as well as Sinead O'Connor. With not, her approval. With her approval, yeah. Yes. And if she hasn't done um, press for no, it, obviously. She obviously doesn't own time. the rights to nothing compares to you. Yeah, yeah, Prince, Prince. Yeah. Isn't that so sad? Yeah, and that was like, that's the title of the documentary, yeah. But I mean, all the other songs, like Mandinka is in it. Yes, but Prince's sister wouldn't allow them to use nothing yeah. compares to you, because obviously himself and Sinead fell out. I had a big fall out that, or whatever. That yeah, and that, I mean, to be that fair, that kind of only, sums it up, doesn't it? Yeah, that she's had like so many kind of battles with, you know, with herself, sorts, with yeah. the industry, with everything else. Yeah. What are you going to give that? Four out of five. It's Brilliant. really worth a watch. Yeah. Fantastic. It, where can people see that actually? Nothing compares. Oh, it's in loads of places. It's getting All a big movies. release. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. Be yeah. Big movies, It'll okay. be everywhere. Yeah. Now let's talk about uh, quickly the Lost King. This is a new yeah. movie by Stephen Frears. What's it about? Yes. So this is about. Do you remember that t story a couple of years back where Richard the Third um, was but, discovered in a car park? Yeah. Yeah. That's it. So it's basically the story of what happened. A woman, Philippa Langley, played by Sally Hawkins, leads this crusade to convince the University of Leicester to dig up this car park. Steve Coogan wrote it uh, with the guy Jeff Pope who did Philomena. So it's kind of re-teaming that team. On the surface, you would think this is kind of going to be along the same lines of Philomena, you know, same cast, yeah. uh, same writing director. It's not the same at all. And it's primarily due to the fact that it's about English monarchy and who really gives it a <laughs> what about English monarchy? Well, Steve Coogan, like, but Steve Coogan can kind of bring a bit of light to things, can he not? It you no, know, he fun. does like he can make things light, definitely. Like, but his when he writes stuff, like he generally does tend to kind of <laughs> get a little bit up with his own, you know what, and be a little yeah, bit sort okay. of high high handed about it. And that's what he's doing here. Um, I mean, Sally Hawkins is brilliant in it as well, but it's just the whole. I'm genuinely into the Plantagenets, so I might Are actually. You really? Yeah, yeah, my really like like Plantagenets. Plant right. I can never say it. Uh, really quickly, uh, there is another documentary stars, that is coming out. Yeah, two, two, two stars, stars. Sorry, another documentary coming out. Vicky. Vicky Phelan. Yeah. So this is the documentary about Vicky Phelan about the cervical check scandal again. Very similar to uh, Nothing Compares, and it's about a woman against the, the Irish kind of system, if mm. you like, you know. But yeah, really harrowing, really kind of inspiring as well, what she went through, the fact that she had to, you know, face this, face her own mortality, but then also face, you know, government, uh, like the HSC and all the rest of it, you know, have to speak out publicly against it. So it's really a, a film of uh, human strength and the idea of what she had to go through while also facing... Yeah. Wow. Her own mortality, and, like. and then two hundred other yeah. women were in the same boat yeah. as well. Yeah. Like, and she, one. she's obviously star in it as well. Yeah, she, is, uh, yeah, she's, so. yeah, she's um, in the interview. Uh, Brian Lloyd five. from Entertainment.ie. Thank you very much for joining us. We have lots more on them to come after the short break.
welcome back. Now, as with most of our healthcare system, waiting lists for the National Gender Service are at an all-time high. And joining us now to discuss is healthcare officer at the Trans Equality Network of Ireland, Noah Halpin. Good morning to you. Good morning. Can you Thank tell you. me what the um, Trans Equality Network does? So, the Transgender Equality Network Ireland is... Um, we are the only solely trans organisation in the country. So what we do is we try to advance the rights and equality of all trans people and their families living in Ireland, be that through education, support, advocacy across many sectors, all sectors of Irish society. And trans is something, I suppose, that is a word that has certainly come into our everyday vocabulary, vocabulary especially in the last few years. For you, when was it, when was it something that you were... I, I suppose the word trans wasn't even known by you when yeah, you were so small. Of course, like a lot of people don't have the language when they're young children, but my very first realisation that I was not a girl was when I was three years old. I remember saying to to people in my play school, I'm not a, bo I'm not a girl, I'm a boy, you know, and of course you don't have the language of when course. you're that age. So it was when I was about... 15 years old, I heard the word trans and I went through kind of my young life saying there's something wrong with me, there's, you know, I'm, I'm not like the other girls. But then I heard the word transgender and I, on a documentary and I said, oh God, <laughs> it's were you, were you telling your parents about this? Um, not at the time, I very much kept it to myself. I was in an all girls boarding school at the time, which of course is a very difficult <laughs> environment to try and communicate yeah. that to anybody. but. I did say it to them. It wasn't until I was about 25 that I oh, wow. said it to them. And yeah. And, and how, how was that then? Because I know that when, when you said it, you, in 2016, you, you began the process. Mm -hmm. so, so how it must have been important to have support. Yeah, and I had a huge amount of support from my friends and a lot of, a lot of trans people, a lot of LGBT people will tell you that, you know, we have a chosen family. And, you know, our chosen family are our peers and our friends and people who go through similar experiences. And I had a huge amount of support from, from my friends and, and family as well. But that didn't help when I was trying to actively transition, when I was trying to actively access services. You know, you get so much support from your friends, but you need that support from society and from, from doctors and things like that as well, which just wasn't coming. And things have changed dramatically in Ireland, but you're still saying like we are way behind other countries. Because I know like, in my case, I know uh, Carl's sister, her children have trans people in their classrooms and they, they openly talk about it, which I think is amazing. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and these are, these are like 12 year olds and nine year olds and yeah. are opening, talking about the trans person in their class. Yeah, and, and the same with me, my, my little niece, Willow, hello Willow, um, she's nine years old and, you know, she has a trans person in her school and it's nothing to them. It's, you know, and oftentimes in, in my work, sometimes parents will phone me and say, oh God, I'm so worried. My child has told me they're trans and oh my God, I'm so worried they get bur bullied and I say, the kids are not the ones to worry about. The kids are all yeah. right. There we go. The kids are, the right. kids are all right. And that's <laughs> yeah. the issue. Uh, it does come from adults. Can we talk about for someone who is trans in Ireland and they want to start the process? Mm -hmm. There's there's major issues with delays with the National uh, Gender Service. Yeah, so unfortunately, you know, and it's important to note, not every trans person is going to want med medical intervention. Not everyone will. Yeah. A lot will. But in Ireland, unfortunately, we're stuck in this situation where... Healthcare for trans people, what we call gender affirming healthcare, is massively underfunded, massively understaffed. Um, Can I just be clear? Sorry, is that when you want to change? Yeah, so from, that's. That you change your gender? Yeah, so that's physical transition. Yes. So that is your if you, gen, you might yeah. want hormone treatment, mm. you might want some gender affirming surgeries, things like that. So the waiting list currently in Ireland, um, as stated by the National Gender Service, is three years. However, we do know many trans people who have been on that waiting list five years plus. Um, and that is only to get your first assessment. That is not to access actual treatment. And that could take even a year plus longer than that. Is that to get your assessment for, for hormones? Yeah. Or is it? Yeah. And this is and, and when we talk about assessments to even get hormones, these assessments should not be in place in, in, in the first place because, you know, the World Health Organization and Ireland are signatories to the World Health Organization. Mm. 
you know, they changed uh, ICD-11 is what it's called, the, the International Classification for Diseases. We should be following absolutely every guideline that the World Health Organization make. But the World Health Organization declassified trans identities as mental health or behavioural disorders some years ago. But we are still treating them as such and we are still forcing trans people to go through multiple psychiatric assessments when the World Health Organization is telling us that's, don't that's do that. That's not necessary. How, yeah. how many do you have to do in Ireland? So in Ireland, it's a minimum of two. Depending on the person, depending on the case, that could be three, four, five, six. Um, and these are not assessments that are kind of generic mental health assessments. These are assessments that delve into someone's sex life, which is not appropriate. It is not anything to do with gender identity. It delves into people's past traumas, mental health histories. Um, basically, you describe your life from birth mm. to present day. This is not advised by the World Health Organization. Yeah. And as but signatories to the World Health Organization, we, shouldn't we be should that. not be doing this. Do, do you know how many trans people are looking for these services in Ireland? So in Ireland, we have about 1% of the population experience gender variance at some point in their life. That would be about 50,000 people. Yeah. However, actively kind of transitioning, we would say it's 0.33%, which would make about 16,000 people. Okay. Accessing or services. actively transing. Yeah. 16,000 in Ireland at the moment. Yeah, but we would say about five to 6,000 people are accessing services and services might be medical services, support groups, things like that. That other kind of 10, 11% or 11,000 percent, we will see them when we have services. We will see those people comfortable enough available. to come out when they know that they can live their life happily with the services. We, gender reassignment surgery is not done in Ireland. You go through the, the National Gender Service, you have your assessment, it can take years, and then you could get a referral for mm -hmm. surgery in another country. What are you asking for the government to do here, Noah? We're asking for a number of things. So, as you said, we're in, there's no gender affirmation surgeons in this country. Every single trans person needs to travel outside of Ireland to have surgery. Yeah. Because of how bureaucratic the system is, because of the delays, almost every one of those people are going to go privately abroad, fundraise, go into debt with loans. How much would it cost? Depends on the surgeries. Yeah, so course, it, it could be anything between 5,000 to 100,000, depending on what surgery someone oh is, God, is looking right. for. So what we, we are asking for is, number one, investment in services. If this was happening, this this is affecting less than 1% of the population. If it was affecting 50%, the government will be on it in a second. Totally, yeah. But because it's not, they don't care. Um, so what we're asking for is a number of things. Investment in services. Mm. That's what we need. We need more staff, but we also need a model of care that reflects the World Health Organization's guidelines. Mm. Yeah. You know, mm. that will change things. At the moment, the reason waiting lists are so long is because every single person referred to this service is being bottlenecked into two psychiatrists. If we two. <laughs> two, only two. So if we were to invest in services, if we were to create care in the community, GPs can provide the service. There's nothing yeah. that says they can't. Yeah. Um, so if we were to change the model of care to international best practice, to World Health Organization guidelines, it would mean that we have a model of informed consent. Yeah. If, if, more if people can access, more people can, can get these services. It will be based on a system of people being believed and not a system of people having to prove, prove themselves. themselves. Which is something mm. that has been done wrong if, in this country If there is people um, looking in this morning and they want to find out more information, where can they go to? So they can always contact us at TENI, the Transgender Equality Network, Ireland. Um, and you can email us at office at tenny.ie. Our phone number is on our website, which is www.tenny.ie. We have multiple officers. Um, we have a, a family and youth education officer. We have a third level and a corporate education officer. Yeah. I'm the healthcare officer at Tenny. 
and it's well staffed. a community development You're officer. You're absolutely there. And I know that in the online world, <clears> it's very fraught at the moment for an awful lot of uh, trans people. We really appreciate you coming in. And, you know, just talking and, and talking to us about your story, we really appreciate it. No, Alvin, thank you so, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. And we'll put that information up on our Facebook page as well yeah. if people want to want to find out. Thank you very much for Excellent. that. Thank you, Beth. Now, after the break, for our City Star, Ryan Andrews tells us about bringing Marilyn, Marilyn Monroe's legacy to life in a new theatre production. Mercedes Ryan Andrews has been a staple in Carrickstown for more than a decade, but he has many strings to his bow. He does indeed. Ryan Andrews, good morning. Good it's morning, lovely to guys. have you here. Thanks so much for having me, as always. I Listen, love it. we know you're doing your thing on Fair City. We know that you're always in the Olympia Panto. We know that you can dance, that you go now. Got up mountains. Director. He doesn't stop. You're a director now. Yeah. Tell us about your directorial debut. So, directing and producing a brand new dance theatre show. So, this is called The Blonde Bomb Show and it's all based around the life of Marilyn Monroe. So dance theatre shows are hugely popular across England and America, but there it is. You can see there, there's Laura Nolan from Dance with the Stars playing Marilyn Monroe. We're bringing it to the Manny Hall. And the idea of this is, like any shows or musicals, there's singing, there's acting and there's dancing. We're gonna portray her entire life all through dance. So right from a young age, Norma Jean, the highs, the lows, um, all through ballroom, Latin, jazz, Broadway, lyrical, contemporary. There's no wow. talking, there's, there's no, no talking. singing. It no. is dance. Just dance. Wow. So the idea of that is, when you look at this, okay? This like, looks amazing. Yeah, it looks, yeah. <laughs> it's actually very, it's like, I was, I was thinking, I was looking at that there going like, that's only just a short clip of what it actually does. So basically when you see shows and when you see people dancing, it shows a different type of emotion. You know, doing a rumba when something is really slow or doing a cha-cha when it's a bit more kind of fiery and stuff. And the Broadway of going to Hollywood in the 1960s. So basically, it's that type of thing. You're telling a story all through dance. So, because you were in Dance with the Stars, yes. I think you came second in it. Thanks for reminding yeah. me, Tommy. Yeah. 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 Very early in well the morning for that. Yeah. Uh, not first or last. <laughs> I mean, um, but is that what gave you the inspiration to bring all that crew into it as well? And also thinking, well, I did come second, so I'm going to actually direct them <laughs> instead of taking Close, part. It's actually Ian Bannum, who is the co-choreographer of Dancing with the Stars. He does all the pro numbers every single week. So all the kind of the dancing, him and Lilia kind of choreograph. It's his idea. It's his creation okay. and he saw this and then everybody obviously wants to work with Ian he's an absolute genius so he came to me and was like I have this show what do you think is there is there lyrics in the songs yeah so it's actually all popular songs from like ever like from sing 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 from the era from 40s 50s 60s uh, Candle in the Wind there's all iconic songs that people would know because that was obviously Elton John wrote that mm. for Norma Jean so oh, there's all iconic songs. Diamonds from are a girl's, girl's best, best friend. friend. I want to be loved by you. It's all oh, Marilyn's hits, songs, yeah. but also songs from that era. Like, how do you think? Because I know what you say. These inter this isn't a, an interpretive dance show. This is very stylized, choreographed, yeah. proper dances. How do you think an Irish audience is going to take to that? Because we love a musical. Absolutely. And now you're turning it into this is dance, my friends. Yeah. Dance. And I tell you, there's something because that is obviously starting out a kind of a concern you would have like I like I always think of like my mom and dad like they need to be told exactly what it is what they're going to see so I kind of showed them bits and pieces and how you link stories and when you show Marilyn and her vulnerable side then you hit it in with the white dress the seven year itch oh, like yeah. it all comes in and it's actually you have to have a little bit of your thinking cap on but it's a uh, we're doing well. Look, there it is, and we'll, well be seeing that like on the night. Everybody and everybody, like you think of Dance with the Stars, like everybody wants to get tickets to go and watch that Absolutely. because they love it, and there's yeah. the mood and the energy and the wow factor of it. Yeah. Uh, there's obviously Marilyn Monroe. She's in the press moment because yes. there's this movie called Blonde, yeah. and it hasn't had the best reviews, and it hasn't shown her life as really quite the Absolutely. picture that we expected. Yeah. So has, does this kind of bring out the the fun, the amazing side that made Marilyn Monroe the, yeah. the, the iconic person that she is? Tommy, I'll take all that down. You wrote that there. <laughs> Perfect. That's amazing. But that's exactly what we're trying to do. With Blonde, that was based on a fictional book. And obviously, they based the film on this fictional book. So a lot of the stuff and the facts aren't true. 
their, okay. you know, and what we're exactly what we're trying to do. We're going to try and show the iconic side of her. What everybody loved was yeah. that Marilyn Monroe, and we're going to bring that out. You're doing all this. Are you going into back into Fair City again soon as well? Yeah, in the next couple of weeks in the lead up to Christmas. When I talk to you, I get very tired. You do <laughs> 75 things at once. You're going back in in the lead up to Christmas. Yeah, there's, uh, I think there's four or five weeks um, spaced out now before Christmas, and then the Olympia Panther at Christmas. We're already getting ready for Alan that. Hughes is here. You're not allowed to mention another uh, panto. Oh, oh yes, I am. <laughs> He's behind me. <laughs> oh, yes, he is. There are other uh, pantos. Uh, <laughs> and engaged. Oh, You're going to be getting... Uh, this panto. He's going to be getting married next summer as well. Like, yeah. uh, how do you get away with doing all this stuff? Oh, what do you mean? How do you get away? <laughs> well, I mean, no, but I mean, they have a very old, lovely relationship, <laughs> yeah. which is obviously very supportive. Yeah, because uh, Michaela is also in. Um, I, Michaela started with Alan in the. It was the Tivoli. The Tivoli actually yeah. before that, Anthony. So, oh, oh God! Yeah, like many Come years back. ago. So Michaela is the dance captain. She's also in the Olympia Panto, and we teach our stage skill together. So Michaela's also in the industry as well. So she okay. understands and accepts it all as well. You made so. me so tired, honestly. The stage oh. school, the, the, but the, the it sounds, sounds great. It's in the O'Mahony Hall in yeah. the Helix, and that's a big place to fill. Big, big, big stage. So yeah. the Blonde Bombshell yes. comes to the Helix uh, on the 20th of November. Yes. People can find it on thehelix.ie if you want to get tickets. And it's just dance, just yeah. watching Marilyn right. Monroe dance. I think that's what Tommy said. It's like you're like what dance with stars on every Sunday night. People would get a front row seat to see the. Yeah, you'd write all the blurbs for oh, things that's now. You're very I love that, Tommy. That's <laughs> no biggie. You go into copywriting and everything like that. Don't Don't were you so. nervous directing it? Not really, no, because it's like with the panto and stuff, you're always hands on and you always see how things can work. And it's like, I'm trying to bring the story out of it as yeah. well as the dancing as well. So, no, really loving it and love learning it. a lot. And it's a challenge, isn't it? Challenge. Yeah. That's what you want. You constantly want to evolve a and keep challenged and uh, stuff as well. Ryan was, did come in and he was like, I thought you'd be doing Hell Week to Tommy. And he's like, no, not a chance. I'm starting to think you're talking about getting tickets to Dancing with the Stars. Are you doing Dancing with the Stars? Oh, I'm absolutely not doing that either. <laughs> we'll see. He's just talking absolutely about see. going to base camp in Everest as well. Yeah. <laughs> I know. So, You're very lazy, play. you are. Thank fair you, Ryan. No we'll talk to you guys. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. 20th of November. Uh, coming up on Fridays, Ireland AM, I'm a celeb winner and kids' TV favourite. Giovanna Fletcher. Thank Yay, you. There she's in the house. <laughs> and we look at how generations stuck at home have become victims of the country's housing crisis. Lots, lots, lots more, of course. We will see you next Monday, but come join the gang tomorrow. Have a great weekend. See you tomorrow. Bye. Or Monday. Bye. <laughs>